All right, let me start from the top. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Angela Peacock and I'm a subject in the film Medicating Normal. I was trained as a social worker and therapist just like Wendy, but I was also harmed by a psychiatric medication I took as prescribed, which caused me to become part of the movement of people that are bringing attention to the harm that can happen sometimes from the mental health care system. I also volunteer doing outreach from the film and I host conversations like this one today. Today is our 25th interview and our guest is Wendy Dolan. We first met Wendy, I've heard about her work, about her tragic story, um, and I invited her to a private screening of Medicaid Normal in Chicago. It was in July, I think, or August of 2019, so it's been a while. Um, what happened was she, we all watched the film together. There was about 150 guests there, and when the film uh, wrapped, we gave Wendy the floor because I just know how valuable her work is, and she stood up and she said, why didn't you guys mention Akathisia? <laughs> Because it was so clearly that Angie and Dave were suffering from it. And I think for me, it was the first day I really had recognition that Angie, you did. Like, there's a word for that, what happened to you. And it was like, I knew, but I didn't want to know because I know that was a fatal condition for a lot of people, you know? But anyway, that's how we met Wendy. I mm -hmm. wanted to talk to her more. I did it. The, the time has gone by, the pandemic has happened. So I'm just excited about this conversation because it, it feels like the we needed to have the conversation two years ago, but now we're going to have it today. So with, uh, let, me let me tell you about her work. Wendy is a licensed clinical social worker. She's a certified family therapist in private practice in the Chicago area and is an internationally recognized health and safety advocate. She founded the Medication-Induced Suicide Prevention and Education Foundation. It's called MIST, M-I-S-S-D. So you'll hear me refer to that. It follows the death of her husband Stewart in 2010 who died after suffering from an adverse drug effect called akathisia. MIST educates the public about akathisia in a wide variety of ways and is proud to be involved with advocacy groups such as the Consumers Union, the Safe Patient Project, and the National Center for Health Research. Wendy has been recognized by the International Society of Ethical Psychiatry and Psychology with its Humanitarian of the Year Award. She holds a Bachelor's in Early Childhood Education from the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana and it has a master's in social work from Loyola. MIST educates the public about akathisia in a wide variety of ways and is proud to be involved with advocacy groups such as the Consumers Union. I already said that part. <laughs> Wendy, would you like to share a few words about your work, about how we met, anything? Yeah, no, thank you for that great um, introduction. I have to say how deeply moved I was by medicating normal. I mean, just the title was so impactful for me. The fact that people are experiencing stress at work, you know, break up with someone and we're medicating sometimes what is just the normal parts of being human. And I was taken very much about the title, loved the journey, sorry about the journey, but love the journey. And as you'll hear later in our um, work today, I do a lot of work with the military. So I loved hearing about your experience with the military. But it's regarding the word akathisia, you know, one of the things that I appreciate you addressing that issue today is the pharmaceutical industry has pretty much tried to water down the term. Like they'll say it's restless leg syndrome or emotional ability. And you know, as a social worker, being moody doesn't lead to ending your life. And so I think that that's why I let that word actually out there. So I'm glad that you now have said that that's what you're experiencing. That's the word. That's the word. Yes. The film was really impactful and brilliant. I was really happy to see that work. Thank you. So we have a lot of people in the audience today and we look forward to their questions. I'm going to ask a few just to get our conversation started and then we will take from the audience. So if you have a question while we talk, Nicole will pass it to me. So the first, this is always hard for me to ask because um, I don't ever want to feel like to re-traumatize someone, but I know you're out there and you're talking about Stuart. So can you tell us about your husband? Um, what happened? Kind of take us through that. Yes, no, I, I appreciate that. In fact, as we were talking earlier, it's very fortuitous, spiritual, whatever you want to call it, that Stuart will be gone 11 years from today. And it was really starting the Saturday night when he first took Paxil that things happened. I mean, the thing to know about Stuart is he was just a regular person. I mean, no history of mental illness, 
um, great relationships with people. We were high school sweethearts. We'd been together 42 years, two completely functioning kids. He was a high powered attorney in the city of Chicago. And probably in like June-ish, he started getting a little bit of stress at work and thought that he would take, you know, um, Paxil, paroxetine. And almost from the moment he took it, it was, I, I call it the crescendo, where things, he just was to himself and the crescendo the night before he, he had a medication and do a suicide, um, started weepy, cognitively confused, um, just not himself. He was um, on the front stairs of the house, just talking to like a friend and kind of pacing, you know, we were outside and it was just very odd. But it crescendoed to the night before he died. He kept saying to me, Wendy, I don't, he's at dinner tapping his foot. And he said, Wendy, I don't get it. I still feel so anxious. And, but you know, he was someone who, well, okay, I'll listen to a meditation tape backwards in time. He said, will you listen to the meditation tape with me? And my response was like, honey, I, you know, you're fine. And then he said he would get up and exercise and he did. And then talked to him in the morning and he was okay. And then he went out to lunch with a client. He made a forward date for the next week. And an hour later, after he got back from his office, got up from his desk, walked to a train station he would never take. And a nurse saw him before he leaped and said he was you know, um, pacing like a caged polar bear. And what I want your viewers to understand is because this was what was tricky to me. And thank David Healy, who I know very well, you know, who's really an authority on akathisia, really explained it to me because I kept saying, what could happen in that hour? And he did a wonderful example of explaining to me that if you're in a nursing home and there's two stations and some with when Parkinson's is walking down the hall, one nursing home person would say, wow, that person's fluid. But by the time they get to the next station, they freeze. And he calls it the flip. It's sort of light switch, that flip that happens that you go from being okay to then, you know, ending your life. And so um, it was shocking. You know, when I told people that Stuart died by train, who pushed him? Like, you know, no one could ever believe it. But I want to just lead into something that we've talked about. How did I find out about akathasia? So, I mean, I was in no position to be making any kind of statement. And unbeknownst to me, two of my friends who were lawyers were researching this and looking into it. I remember walking my dog and about a month and a day after he died, my girlfriend called me and said, akathisia. And I remember finding the piece of paper scratched out, didn't know how to spell it. And when I got home that night, I Googled Paxil, akathisia and suicide and whoa, up, out pops Dr. Peter Bregan's article, Glaco Smith Klein hid Paxil induced suicide. And then all these other articles came up and I became obsessed and I knew that I'd have to do something. And so that was my first introduction to akathisia. That's terrible. So you, you talked about kind of, um, he's getting cognitively foggy. The nurse saw him pacing. Did you notice any other things that kind of, and, and at, you know, that you learned later that these were cues well, that pacing, he was doing? The, the pacing, the agitation, the weepiness. But you know, the thing about akathisia that's difficult, and we're gonna get to some of the signs and symptoms, the outer ones are easier to see, but it's the inner ones that are really um, questionable. So after finding out about akathisia, I took a two-part approach. I got together a group of board members who were mainly friends of Stuart's and mine, and we wanted to do something. And we came up with the fact that we wanted to bring attention to the world about akathisia. That was sort of a... Um, different sort of way of handling things. It's not like you say to people, I'm going to start an organization that deals with medication and do suicides. I mean, that just really is 
um, that great. And then I also took a legal journey as well. You're all situated, oh, you're good. So I took- Yeah, um, the internet is bad. I know, Sorry. I feel terrible for you right now. It's just so upsetting. But what I wanted to say is before we go on to other things, so we, we started MIST and I kind of really liked the way the name was formed. When everybody passes away, you always talk about the things that you missed. And so the medication induced suicide in memory of Stuart came about. And, um, you know, so we, we formed this organization and we just decided to draw attention to MIST and the mission of MIST simple, when you stop, start or change the dosage of many, many classes of medications, be aware. And as I say all over when I speak, if for whatever reason you were starting to take the med, no matter what it is, you either are getting worsening symptoms or you are um, getting new symptoms you need to, you know, call 911 or your doctor. Yeah. So right now I'm going to play a video from um, Mist, so we can see what's what's the public. I love these videos. They're so well made. They're so explanatory. Uh, they really help people understand it in a very easy way. I think that's what film and art can do. So yes. let's play let's play this video so everybody can see in the audience. Thanks. Every day, people around the world are prescribed medication. However, when starting, stopping, or changing dosages, especially those for mental health conditions, there can be unexpected side effects. Uh, I couldn't sit still. Uh, I was pacing up and down. I was crying. My mouth felt like I was uh, sucking on a battery. It felt like I had worms crawling under every inch of my skin. Side effects that steadily grow more severe until they become unbearable. I attacked myself with a, with a knife and was hallucinating. I knew that if I didn't die from it, I would kill myself. It felt like I was being burned alive. I wanted to die. It's called akathisia, an intense inner restlessness brought on as a side effect of medication. As many as 5% of patients taking certain medications suffer from akathisia. And for them, the feeling of being unable to stop moving becomes torture. Death can be a welcome result. Unfortunately, many patients and their doctors don't know enough about akathisia. Help us spread the word about akathisia. By learning more about this disorder, we hope to empower those suffering and their loved ones to take action before it's too late. If you or anyone you know is showing signs of akathisia, call your doctor or emergency services immediately. For more information about akathisia, visit our website at mist.co. That's such a great video. Um, just watching it, it, it reminds me of what I went through that most of my symptoms were inner. I didn't really pace, but it was like, it almost felt like there was too much pressure in my body and it wanted to come out. And it was uh, like an energy, like I was plugged into a light socket or something. Too much adrenaline, intensive, intense uh, suicidal thoughts, like over and over and over and over. It was basically like everything that they said in the video. Um, I'm glad I'm six years out from that almost. So it's a little easier to talk about. But like I said, when we met, I didn't even want to know that that's what it was and that it had a name and that you can, a lot of people die from it, you know, it's intense. So can you tell, tell us a little bit about those videos? Well, so what happened was, you know, the, the mission of MIST has always been education and prevention. And we take that mission and the fundraising we do very seriously. So the question became how to reach the public and videos are the way to go. And so we've done three videos. You saw the first one, you'll see another one later. And um, the middle one that we're not showing today is what does akathisia look like? And we just found that they were a wonderful way because pre-COVID and when we would do conferences, they were wonderful to play. And I'm really happy, I checked this morning 
as of today, all three videos have had 310,000 views. So it's really fantastic with those videos. I mean, one thing we didn't include in the video, which I've included in other presentations is the different types of akathisia. I think that's important to know. I mean, there's, you know, acute, which happens right away. That what's what happened to Stuart. Then there's tardive, meaning delayed. And then there is withdrawal akathisia, which is getting, yeah, raise your hand, getting a lot of attention, especially in the UK. And then the fourth one, which was the most disturbing to me and something that I learned along this journey is chronic akathisia. Like I just kind of thought, well, you stop the med, it's done. And oh. the people who suffer day in and day out, and I, 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 it's, it's torturous, it, it's heartbreaking. I don't know how they survive. No, and I can say mine has kind of changed over the years, like the first two and a half years, it was really intense. But now I still kind of like do this rocking back and forth where I, I can't stand still, um, like in a checkout lane or in my car when I'm at a stoplight. It's like a, it's like feeling like you have to go all the time and you can't, and this is five and a half years later after the episode, you know? So I've, right. I've also noticed it kind of changes over time for some people. Right. So while it's frequently associated with drugs, usually for mental health, like antipsychotics, antidepressants, benzodiazepines, what other classes of drugs can cause it? That's a great question because, you know, when we first started MIST over 10 years ago, we were incorporated in 2011 and we were primarily focused on the SSRIs and antipsychotics. And as we expanded our social media presence, you know, we have a beautiful website that we're actually redoing even again. And we do something called Shared at MIST and people from all over the world, literally, will um, write into us. And, and as we expanded our conferences, England, you know, Denmark, you know, all through the United States, we would hear about Accutane for pimples, you know, for skin. You heard about, you know, malaria drugs, you know, um, Shantax, the smoking cessation drug. You heard of, I mean, Erin Foster has been on the news last year and said that when she was on Tamiflu, she became suicidal. And also some of the antiemetics you take for nausea during chemo. So there are way, way more classes of drugs. And I think that has helped increase the importance of missed message. Like if you think, well, I'm not on an antidepressant, I'm not on an antipsychotic, I'm okay. You have to be aware of all these different classes of medication, even Benadryl, which is over the counter can cause akathisia. So you just have to be aware, again, I'm not anti-medication, that's not our, we're, we're safe patient, but it's just, it's about awareness and being in touch with your own body. Yeah, so that leads us to the second video. So let's watch the second one. Sure. And this video, I have to say, really syncs in well with um, medicating normal because these are people sharing what happened to their loved ones. My son broke up with his long term girlfriend and was effectively heartbroken. I made an appointment with a doctor who prescribed him with an antidepressant. My brother was a successful lawyer working abroad, but in 2018, he became stressed about missing his children and an imminent divorce. He tried therapy and alternative treatments, but eventually was prescribed an SSRI. I took my daughter to a psychiatrist when I thought she was experiencing mild social anxiety from changing schools. After she was prescribed an SSRI, she became more anxious. The doctor then increased her dosage. I later learned her dilated pupils were a sign of drug toxicity. After my husband started taking an anti-anxiety med prescribed for work stress, I noticed a general change in his personality. He was weepy, agitated, showed confusion, and started pacing. My son always had a need to be drawing, tapping his hands, or engaging in repetitive movements in an attempt to keep his akathisia from overtaking his body and mind. I bought my daughter a makeup mirror weeks before her death, but she remarked it was too bright. 
and hurts my eyes. I felt trapped, caged, terrified, brain damaged, helpless. I felt and thought that the only way out was to kill myself. I was shocked because my husband loved life and his death made no sense. Intuitively, I knew something didn't add up. I would like people to know the signs of akathisia and that despite the innocuously worded description in patient information leaflets, akathisia can be very dangerous. Akathisia is a drug-induced disorder caused by hundreds of different drugs prescribed for various ailments. Nobody is immune to akathisia. This is not the same as starting to have suicidal feelings caused by depression. Many in the medical profession are unaware of akathisia. My akathisia was so bad that death would have been welcome. But at least I knew why I was feeling that way, and that things could get better. Knowledge is key in preventing suicides in affected patients. If akathisia is properly recognized and treated, lives can be saved. When you stop, start, or change the dosage of many classes of medication, if new or worsening symptoms present themselves, call 911 or go to the nearest emergency room and tell them you may be suffering from akathisia. Together, we can protect ourselves and our loved ones. See mist.co for more information and take our free akathisia course. So Wendy, I have to I have to give one little pushback. Wait, wait, wait. My computer is passing out. Okay, okay. Sorry. It <laughs> played the next video, of course. Um, God, I gotta learn this new computer. Anyway. So one pushback from our community would be, don't you dare call 911 yes. because they don't know anything about akathisia. And if anything, they make you think that you're even more crazy because you come in with your own diagnosis. So I'm sorry to bring that up, but can you address no, that? No, no, I have to tell you, that is something that troubles us. That's probably the most, people appreciate our work. They're glad that it's out there, but they don't like that suggestion. And quite frankly, you know, we have doctors on our board. We've thought about this. Other than not taking the drug at all, what do you do? You know, if you're on the verge of suicide and having suicidal thoughts, you know, yes, it's not always the, the best outcome. And thank you for bringing that up because I do speak about that. But at this stage, unless people don't start the meds initially, once they're in that akathagic reaction and feeling suicidal, you know, it's, what do you do? It's tragic. Yeah. We have a lot of, there's a lot of peer support groups online that help each other, but you, you see these people messaging several times a day, like, I can't do this one more second. I'm dying. Nobody helped me. My family doesn't believe me. My doctor doesn't believe me. And it almost pushes a person to suicide because there isn't help for it, you know? No, thanks for bringing that up because that's exactly something that we struggle with. We, I'll tell you what we struggle with. We get a lot of requests from doctors. Do you know of a, I mean, first of all, we're not, we can't give medical advice or legal advice. You know, we're just an information organization, but we do get a lot of questions about doctors who would know how to treat akathisia. And so that is the, and again, I welcome anyone's suggestion and I know that there's open platforms, but in the moment when someone is saying, I don't know if I can go on an in, another minute, they can be talking to all the bloggers they want. They, yeah. they need an intervention. Yeah. So I appreciate that question very much. Thank you for addressing it. So the next question is when you learned, when you learned that the company that made Paxil knew that it created suicidal thoughts, actions, suicide, um, even among older consumers not covered by the FDA black box warning, which only covers teens, you sued the drug maker GlaxoSmithKline. A Chicago jury found it in your favor, but their decision was later overturned by a higher court. In what ways have your efforts to help others be safer consumers also helped you na effectively navigate your own grief and loss? Yeah, no, what, you know, the lawsuit became a, you know, it's really interesting. The lawsuit was in one box mist was in another and my grief and loss was in another. I mean, I'm, I know you had Michael Baum on and he, you know, Bob Hedlund is masterful and 
they uncovered all of the secret documents that showed that Paxil knew there was a way higher increase of suicide. And I think the jury saw the actual data and that's when they awarded me the win. In fact, um, the lawsuits talked about in, in law schools now, because I think Michael addressed this, that in our country, it's worth repeating though, if the generic companies say, I didn't make the formula, so I'm not responsible. The parent company says, well, I've already passed it along to the generic. And so there's this donut hole of liability. But what this wonderful judge in Chicago, Judge Zagel said, hold on a minute. This is not a generic case. This is product liability. And if you lie about your product, that's fraud in the state of Illinois. And boy, were these wow. lawyers surprised to go on. But Michael Baum and Brent Wisner and then David Rappaport ran this masterful six-week case and, you know, talk about putting, you know, GSK wanted to send a firm message to everybody, don't mess with us because we'll make your life miserable. And it was not easy. So we won, but it was overturned in the Seventh Circuit, not because anybody ever believed Stewart ended his life on purpose. The lower court blamed the drug company, the upper court um, blamed the FDA. And so um, that was the lawsuit. And I still feel very proud in my mind we won, you know, we won. Yeah. Because because really you're the, I don't know, I, may, I might be interpreting it wrong, but weren't you the first one to sue a generic manufacturer of the drug? No. Or the, to blame it on the, the generic. The parent company when yeah. someone was That's on right. the generic. So it was really powerful. But, you know, when you say about the lawsuit, what the lawsuit did for MIST is when they interviewed me and I was on Law 360, New York Times, you know, um, NBC5 Investigates, all these different WGN News Chicago, they always would talk about MIST. So that kind of put MIST on the map even further. But MIST is so, but you bring up a really interesting point. How, you know, how do you deal with this shocking grief and loss? I mean, you know, I still look at a train. I, there's not a time that a Chicago train goes by that I don't have a moment. Wow. But I will tell you that a very wise woman who I meditate with um, over the years said to me, don't get so caught up in mist that you don't take time to grieve. So it's almost like my grieving and loss was in its own particular category. Now, do I feel good that I'm saving lives? Am I... Um, happy that we're making such a difference in the world. But for me personally, my best thing is that my family is on the other side. We still have our moments, but we're on the other side. So and can you talk, talk about how that, how, how you formed MIST and maybe how that, yeah, how that came about? I think you, I mean, let me say this. I mean, you know, I don't know how you, when I heard, um, so after, you know, my girlfriend talked to Michael Baum and he talked to me and then he hooked me up with Kim and and I started hearing about this. How do you just go, okay, going on with my life? And so I knew Stuart backwards and forwards. And whenever there's a suicide, people go, oh, you don't know what goes on. No, you knew. This was not who he was. No, 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 nothing, zero. And I just said, I can't exist with, I can't go on with my life. So it became my life mission and I'm just grateful for this unbelievably talented board. And we we spend a lot of time and resources doing things. I mean, I know you talked about the um, videos, but we have a podcast channel. I'm hoping that you are gonna be on the Mist podcast channel, but we've done train inside of train cars in Chicago. We put mist and on platforms in New York and then in San Francisco on wraparound buses. And our most recent campaign that just started in May was billboards. Mm -hmm. And so we have a billboard in West Virginia that you know says suicide could be your meds because there's a lot of opioid problems and drug problems there. And in Chicago and the way to, you know, like I believe the airport. So we just are out there, you know, conferences. It's it's just, that's, you know, we formed it, but you know, a lot of organizations fizzle. Yeah, you're going strong. 
getting stronger and stronger. In fact, the first few missed events were, you know, friends and family of ours, board members. And by our last pre-COVID um, event, people come up to me and say, who I don't know, and I, I love it. Heard about you, wanted to be here. Your work has given me so much perspective. That's so great. Wow. So I, I love the courses and we're going to talk to Christina who helped develop some of the courses, especially for CME. We're going to talk to her next week, but can you tell us about on MIST's website, what resources are available for uh, just a general patient, the person suffering, and then for healthcare professionals? Well, all our, and that's a great thing. We're, you know, we have all sorts of information on our website, I, our Facebook page. We're always posting, you know, we try to post, you know, almost every, every other day. But um, there is something called the continuing education unit. You know, as a social worker, you need like 30 of these every two years. So on our website, there's a free course and we're developing one for doctors. It's been a little slower of a process than we thought, but I mean, it's written, it's in the final stages. But one of the things we are looking to do is create a, like either a, a scan or something that someone can bring to their doctor's office on their phone. But our newest project, you know, this would be heavenly, is forming a pamphlet. You know how doctor's offices have pamphlets for the drug companies? Yeah. We want to start to create a pamphlet that we could distribute all over the country. That's great. I mean, we know it's a big deal, but it's out there. So we just keep challenging ourselves over and over again. So somebody in the audience is asking a question about, I believe MIST has publicly called for a list of doctors who are experienced in treating akathisia. However, not one doctor has ever responded. Do you know anything about a list? No, I mean, I, I think that like on Mad in America, I know they have a list of doctors, but I have yet to find anyone who specializes. And, and one of the things about this list of doctors is you know, we are very neutral. I mean, you know, um, I asked, what came as part of our lawsuit was the Dear Doctor letter that the prescribing physician got around Paxil. You know, doctors are at the mercy of the drug company saying, and if you read, I was stunned when I read the Dear Doctor letter. It was like, this is the next best thing since sliced white bread. It's going to lower the rate of suicide. And it was really an 800% risk. So that is something that, you know, if there were a list of doctors, that would be fantastic. You're, you've hit on some of the weaker points of wh where we'd like to be. Well, so God, I, not, don't take that as a critique. It just, it, it takes on how widespread this problem is and just the lack of, you know. It's oh, not I didn't interpret it as a critique. Yeah, no. These are things oh, that- You guys are doing awesome. Yeah. This keeps me up at night. You know, the fact that yeah. we don't know what else to say regarding 911. And we know the polypharma that goes on at emergency rooms. We know that. Yeah. And I think that's the, the worst part is watching the people in the support groups and they're suffering so bad and you know, it could go either way. Like they could die tonight, you know? Um, and there's not like a pill you can tell them to go take or, or an easy answer, like go back on the med you came off of or lower the dose. Like we don't even know, you know, the science behind like what is actually going on or what can fix it or, you know what I mean? It's just a, a scary, scary thing. And especially being the person that's suffering from it, like not knowing what to do and having to take You froze there. Froze, Wendy. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, you were going at. Yeah, you're, I'm you're, frozen. you're I'm frozen. Ugh, I'm so sorry, y'all, for this terrible. I'm trying. No, to it's fine. It's part of. It's it's fine. It's part of life. Yeah, that's true. All right. So, um, what akathisia awareness resources? Oh, I already asked that. Sorry, sorry. So, while many nonprofits publicize mental health, few, if any, talk about suicidality as a potential side effect. Even, and I talked about this with Kim and Michael Baum on our previous interviews. If you missed those, you can go back and watch them. I saw them. Like, but like we read that in the FDA pamphlet and we, it's like, we don't believe it or we don't believe that it would happen to us. Um, how do we, you know, how do you guys bring awareness to this and how do we kind of fill that hole? Like, yes, it can happen. It, we hope it doesn't. And some people it doesn't happen and they're fine on their medication. And like we say, we say too, we're not anti-medication, we're pro-informed consent. 
Exactly, exactly. But can you talk about like the suicidality as part of- Thank you, that's a, I, I love this question because one of the things that MIST has tried to do, I here, let me go back. My view of suicide is such that, and I liken it to cancer diagnoses. Like if you said, God forbid, you know, Wendy, I have cancer. And after I said, of course, the supportive words, the first question you say is usually, what kind of cancer? And we've accepted that. When it comes to suicide, they just want you to believe that it's someone who's mentally ill and had severe depression and anxiety. And not that that doesn't incur in a you know, vast majority of cases, but there's the, you know, the football concussions, there's military people coming from contact, people who have been divorced, people coming out of prison, people who lost their jobs, who aren't necessarily, they're dealing with situations. And, and in the case of MIST, you know, a medication induced suicide. So when I say this to people and I've spoken, you know, we, we take every opportunity, like I've spoken at Hazleton, Betty Ford, because of people sometimes taking medications will lead to more alcohol. Or I've spoken to veterans or um, the Wheaton Police Department. And, and one, and, 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 through this journey of always putting ourselves out there at conferences everywhere, I met like, for example, the most recent thing that's sort of fresh off the press is there's a wonderful organization in Chicago called No Shame On You. And Miriam started this organization after being, you know, sort of shunned and shamed within the Jewish community for being mental health disorders. But her work is the Jewish community and beyond. And so recently we, we believe we just got a grant and this will be the uh, in lines with our other videos, but it'll be between No Shame in You and Mist, where we are going to have risks for suicide. That isn't just going to be mental health, and akathisia will be included. So wow. this will probably be the first video throughout the world that will be finally showing akathisia as a sign and symptom. So those are sort of kind of ways you work together, you know, military, internists, you know, I speak in schools of social work. And so there's a way of connecting and spreading the view about suicidality. And because our message is clean, non-threatening, yeah. people can relate to it. So that's sort of like you say with different organizations, how it's yeah. expanded. I really like that. Also, I just want to bring attention to quite often in um, people like me, the patients, they, they get, they present with akathisia, but the doctor will think it's like intense anxiety or it's right. psychogenic or they're delusional or, you know, um, you're just having really bad anxiety. You just need to go take a benzo, go home, sleep it off. You know, I really want to stress that this is um, for anybody out there that maybe doesn't know about it. I've never heard this word that it is the most intense level of suffering that you can experience on this planet like it is inhumane it is literally like the inside of your body turns into a torture device and i'm not being dramatic no you're not no and wendy can attest to this but i want you to know the level of severity that some people i know one of the girls on our team i'm not going to say her name just just to protect her but maybe she said it publicly but i don't know but she has she has paced so hard that her feet were bleeding that is how intense it is okay so um I don't know. I'm just to say that it's a physical thing. It's really not mental. It's not that the person is anxious or they're making it up or they want attention or they're being dramatic. It is like a physical, like your whole body just goes insane. You know? So I just want to stress that before we um, wrap so in a few your question, why I form this, how do you learn that kind of information and, and just say, oh, well, going to go on with my life. I mean, that what you just said gave me goosebumps because it's so powerful. And I think about Stuart's last moments what he must have been going through and, you know, this kind, gentle soul who is being internally tortured. Right. Oh my God. Well, thank you, Wendy, for not letting it. I don't know that, that tragic thing that happens to you. And then you, you could have gone on with your life, but you're, you're not. And I mean, I think our community, I, if, if I can speak for some of them that we are grateful to you, like putting a billboard up with that word, just seeing that word in a train station. I've seen one in person myself and it gave me chills. Like, Oh my God, they're, People, you know, that people care about those of us suffering with it. We're not being ignored the way that some medical professionals can, you know. 
Well, that's Christina. I mean, Christina's line, who you'll be interviewing, is a wonderful support to MIST. As she said, let's make akathisia a household world, word. And that's what we're trying to do. I love it. All right, now this is my favorite question. You, all, you do a lot of work with the military, and I want to know more about it. I know you do work with service dogs, and I wish I could show you, but he's in the air yeah. staying, staying cool. But I just got a new service dog. His name is Raider. He's named after the Marine Corps Special Forces Raiders. He's the cutest little golden retriever. So can you tell me about your work with military veterans, polypharmacy? You know, yeah, no, it's one of my it. favorite. You know, it, it, it's just incredible, and I actually have some notes on that. So real briefly, in the first part of our mist, we used to wear these, we had t-shirts made that we gave out that had the mist logo and the definition of akathisia on the path, you know, can lead to violence, self-harm and suicide. And we did one of these suicide walks and inevitably, you know, I had about 10 or 15 people, people are tapping us on the back going, yeah, that happened to my loved one. And inevitably they were military people. Wow. Go back to, I mean, I'm trying to give this real fast. Go back to our board meeting, and I tell this, and one of my board members works with Canines for Veterans, which is this wonderful organization that trains service dogs for the military. And I met with Mike Tellerino, who's the founder of Canines for Veterans, and he was intrigued, just fascinated because of what he knows goes on with this polypharma with um, military people. So he had me speak at Operation Honor, you know, he had me on a show three times. I went out, you know, um, and as the result of that and the reception we got then missed during when we could, would go to, I don't know the initials, but like the uniform military doctors. Yeah. You know, we, would, we went to Denver, we went to Washington, D.C., and we just have continued to work. But the thing that was most fascinating to me is I remember at one place we were, I think we were in Oak Forest, and it was at a, you know, like a, what a V Hill, what do you call it, VW Hall? And, and sitting after I spoke with my sister in the bar, and all of a sudden people are coming up to me. You know, I was on 22 different meds and one person said, I never was violent in my life and I tried to kill my wife in the middle of the night. And they started to describe this very disturbing thing is that they get a drug, it wasn't working. And because they weren't getting seen frequently at the VA, then they got more of the drug. Well, when that wasn't working, well, then let's throw in a mood stabilizer, but then let's throw in for pain, but then that was making you so hyper that you had to take sleeping pills. And this guy literally was on 22 different drugs. Gratefully over time, and I you know, interviewed his wife on Canines for Veterans, he did better. And the thing that's been staggering to me, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, is the, you know, the number of suicides per day for the military, I believe are close to 22 to 25 per day. Yep. And what was fascinating, and of course with the way politics are today. So in 2016, a bill was introduced and it was called the Veteran Suicide Prevention Act. It was HR 40. Written by John McCain, I think. John McCain, but I think Representative Jolly from um, Florida. I'm all, you know, happy to see that nothing happens. Okay, now I get even more excited. There is a new bill called the Veteran Over Medication and Suicide Prevention Act of 2019. That was observed, that was um, introduced in April of 2019. And finally, they were going to start to do autopsies or check the level of medications. And of course, with everything that's been going on in Congress, I checked this morning, they're still under the heading of introduced. Yeah. Nothing has changed in the years, but it made, it gave me hope. That Can made I tell you? Yeah, I actually went to the, in uh, 2019, I did a VFW Student Veterans of America legislative fellowship. And part of that was they, I wanted to do polypharmacy. They said it was too big of a topic, so I needed to narrow it down. So I did benzodiazepines. But I use that piece of legislation, you know, as part of my research. So when we get to Capitol Hill, 
and I'm presenting, I doing my elevator pitch with legislators and I'm telling them about, you know, veterans are being overprescribed medications. There's polypharmacy problems. Benzodiazepines um, increase the likelihood of suicide 2.5 times. Um, it was like, they didn't want to hear it or something. It was the strangest thing. Maybe it was over their head. It was too scientific. I don't know, but I, I just did not understand it. But listen, I went to the White House, this is under the Trump administration, and we had a meeting with um, the veteran liaison to the White House who actually worked on John McCain's staff and wrote that bill. And he wow. was in the White House. And I said, why is this not law? What is going on here? I don't, I still don't understand it to this day because it does do a five year forensic examination, yes. all the veterans that die, what were they taking? What therapies did they have? Were they being seen? you know, to try to find trends or associations. And I'm like, come on, what, I don't understand. If, if we care so much, why isn't this law? Well, if you ever need, need us. Yeah, I might it, call you. Yeah. It's just infuriating no. to me. So, you know, and so I continue my work with the military and I, um, it's, it's something I'm really proud of. And hopefully this people are getting educated about this polypharma, it's like, yeah. It's scary. Yeah. So at this point, I'm going to move on to um, audience questions. We have quite a few comments. A lot of people saying, you know, thank you for working on this. Someone said calling it inhumane torture is not, does not do it justice because that's how bad the suffering is. Um, so here's a question from the audience. They say uh, one reason why prescription inserts state suicidal thoughts is because of acathesia, but they tone the language down. So how can we possibly get fully informed consent if we're not given the correct information? What a fabulous, fabulous question. You know, that's the thing that's interesting. And I'm glad this, that this person wrote this in because like people will say to me, if you listen to the drug commercials on TV, they'll say you could get suicidal thoughts. So people are going, wow, that's out there. They're not calling it akathisia and the warning stopped at 24 years, you know? So there's no warning that the label doesn't go in. But to your person's reporting, it's true. It's watered down language. I mean, this is something that Kim I know and I've talked about is trying to change that. I mean, really trying to get the word akathisia. It's completely watered down. I think it's on page, I mean, it's probably not even in the insert. If you look at, I think Kim once gave me this book, it's on page 34 of wow. some symptom thing. and. They don't yeah. want to call it what it is. And I agree with you. You're not getting informed consent because they water it down. Yeah. I mean, they're so worried about sexual dysfunction and weight gain. And I'm not saying that that doesn't impact someone's life, but death is a little bit overrides a little weight gain and, you know, lower sex drive. And yeah. that they can't say. Speaking of that, I, just to bring it back, because we're toward the end of the hour, can you say like maybe the top five symptoms of akathisia? And like the range of severity it can show up as? Well, I think, you know, first of all, I personally, from what you just said and people said, you know, like one of the vets I interviewed on, um, you know, Canines for Veterans, Aaron said, I felt like electrical charges on my brain. I literally felt like, you know, bugs were crawling all over me. So, the, you know, but that inner, that inner thing, it's that, it's the torture. But the main thing is marching in place. I'd say pacing. I think the, just besides marching in place, inability to stay still, I think tapping sometimes. And I just think that just acting cognitively confused. Like one of my board members, Gail, whose husband Howard died, from akathisia was watching a TV show and all of a sudden he couldn't remember the plot, you know? So I think that there's the inner and the outer. So does a person have to pace to be able yeah, to no. help? No, no, no. Like Kim said that her husband just had his hands on his head going, I don't get it. I, you know, like almost he was, you know, he, what he was dissociating. Thank you for really clarifying it. Yeah. You don't have to have external symptoms to be suffering yeah so the next one is uh wait let's see someone wants to know how can they speak with you personally is that an option or is there someone at your 
you know, I know you don't give direct medical advice. So if someone wants to get in touch with you. What we do is go through Shared at Mist. It's on our website and we try to respond. And, you know, I, I will call people back. I mean, unfortunately, we're not, we can't give medical or legal advice and we're not a suicide prevention hotline. So that's the thing. But I, I, you know, there are people who have been in contact with me and, you know, and I'm, I'm always happy to do what I can do within my limits of what I can do. Here's a comment. I'm a medical provider, and before experiencing the effects of psychiatric drug withdrawal and akathisia, I also had never heard of it, nor did I ever study the effects of long-term use or discontinuation of psychiatric drugs. Well, to my point, so I mean, and you know, I laugh because I went back to social work school later in life. You know, I did the optional reading, which I never would have done in my 20s. Never did I hear about akathisia, what was presented was what they called the rollback effect, that you got on the drug, it made you manic, and then you acted out your suicidal thoughts. That's what I learned in grad school. I don't know about you. A lot, yes. Um, so here's another one. I'm trying to hurry because you only have until quarter after or 10 after. I can do it at 2.15. I can, you know, I don't have to get on a call for the client until okay, 2.30. I'm good, yeah, I do not want to take you away from your clients. That is so important. Oh, okay, so I'll have two more. So one is, this is just a point that, you know, there are many people who are put on these drugs with no mental or emotional issues, but for physical issues, including sleep problems, tics, pain, are you focusing on them at all through mist? Well, what we do is we do talk about, you know, to me, it's whatever the reason that you took the med. I mean, that's the broad comment. I mean, my response to a lot of this is, that like, I can't remember that wonderful vet and her name is Mary, who is- Oh, yes. Wait, no, no. Vitin, Vitin or whatever. Oh, Mary Vitin, yes, yeah. Dr. Vitin. And she'll talk a lot about, you know, physical activity, doing things. I mean, I, and I do this even with my own practice, meditation, journaling, um, exercise, clean eating, um, you know, Yes, I think there are other ways of treating some of those things, but not, here's the problem, not every insurance company will cover insurance. You know, I work on a sliding scale because it's part of who I want to be, but not everybody does that. And so it's easier just to go to your internist or for women, their gynecologist and say, what's going on? But I, I believe no matter what, the, no matter what reason you started a drug, be aware. Yeah. So the last one is from Bob Fitterman. Yeah. Love Hi, Bob. He's done a review on Medicaid Normal. Check it out. I'll hope Nicole will put it in the comments. But she, he says, I was pleased to attend and report on your Chicago trial against GlaxoSmithKline. I'm also pleased that Bob Headland does the public a great service by seeking to declassify documents and publish them on their website. While it didn't surprise me to learn that GSK hid the suicides that occurred in their packs of clinical trials, I'm wondering if there was anything else that occurred at the trial that surprised you. I just, just the, in a, I mean, Bob actually, it's a wonderful, and not just because I'm in it, but Bob did a wonderful post interview of me that's on his website about the trial. I it just see inappropriateness. I mean, the, I, you know, asking in the same question, I think the over and over again, but I think the thing that really struck me was, so Brett Wisner, who was like, you know, the Monsanto wonder boy, who was, I was one of his first cases says to the, you know, after looking at these internal documents, says to the GSK person, so 25 people died in your study. You didn't put it in. 40 more people became, became akathasic. He goes, you didn't think this was something to report? I mean, those kinds of questions. And when they couldn't, you know, then they, I, I, all I can say is they harassed people. On the stand, asked and answered. They shared- dirty, Like dirty lawyer tricks, basically? I would say, you know, again, as I said early on, their message to consumers is, if you choose to take us on, we will take you on. Wow. Well, that gives me the chills. Whew. Well, thank you for this wonderful conversation, Wendy. Um, 
as we mentioned before we got on the call, it's serendipitous that this is almost the 11th anniversary of Stuart's death. And I hope both of our lives stand as a testament to help others that his death does, you know, does not go without, um, you know, we're carrying on his legacy, both of us talking about oh, this. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, you had also talked a little bit about what's the most thing that I've gained so much about being an ad advocate is just these people who are real and, you know, like, again, this isn't where I thought I'd be, but this idea that to, and you know yourself, there is, it's a, you know, besides being a mom and a grandma, and I, when, when he was a husband, you know, he had a husband, oh. I have to say, my, it, the, the, the feeling of making a difference in the world when people write in, thank you, I never knew it had a name. Thank you for what you're doing. In fact, on one of our billboards, it's quoted on, um, at our Miss Facebook page, some woman who suffered from akathisia actually stopped, pulled over, and got chilled. She said, "Thank you for what you're doing." So that it's it's a hell of a way. Like I think um, Kim uses the term "accidental advocate." Yes, and I, I'm giving credit to her, but it's true. But thank you for these opportunities. And what I always say to people is, if you like what you heard today, go to Miss.co. Co. We're on Facebook. If you like this bit, you know, what happened today, check out our podcast, our videos. This is, it's a movement. It grows. Yeah. So thank you. I'm truly blessed to be here today. Thanks, Angie. Thank you so much. So thank you all in the audience for joining us for this live discussion. Please share it with someone to bring more awareness. If you haven't seen Medicaid Normal yet, just check out our website. We have a $6 screening open until July 31st. And we also add more screenings um, as they come along. If you know anybody who wants to do a screening, please contact us at medicatingnormal at gmail.com. We also have a YouTube channel. This interview will be up in maybe two weeks. And we continue to do interviews. So next week we'll have Christina Kaiser. Who is she a board member with Miss? No, but she's like a, a, an educational <laughs> advisor. I mean, she she wears many many hats. So they should be sure to tune in for that one next week, and we'll talk more about Akathisia 101 and the courses that they offer. She's also the mother of Natalie, who died as a teenager from antidepressants prescribed off label. Off label. Um, the week after that, we will have Kelly Fukrod, who will talk about liberation using holistic healing and if you'd like to support our outreach efforts or bring this film and conversations like these to communities worldwide please make a donation any small big whatever at medicatingnormal.com donate thank you wendy for spending an hour with me um sorry for the <laughs> the technical difficulties and the wi-fi but thank you for hanging in there you just are soul sister to me like i feel like you know i just from the minute you stood up and talked at that screening, yeah. I just, I could feel your heart, you know. Yeah, no, I, I care deeply about you. We're, we're in a, it's a wonderful group of people making a difference in the world. Yeah, thank you all. So everybody have a wonderful day and uh, we'll see you here next week.